Hello, I'm Jim Burnett of NASA's Lewis Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio. During this ninth program of our History of Space Travel series, we'll see the film Debrief Apollo 8. It shows us man's first orbit around the moon. The film was released in 1969. be said to be born when it first performs a useful function. This then is the birth of a machine and the beginning of an achievement. 363 feet tall, weighing just under six and a quarter million pounds. Capable of 180 million horsepower, the first stage engines came from Louisiana. The second stage came from California, as did the third. They were proved out for the mission in Alabama. The vehicle destined to make the moon touch down in a later Apollo mission comes from New York. The guidance and navigation equipment within the narrow instrument ring grew in Wisconsin, was checked in Massachusetts. Electromechanicals within the command and service modules are from Florida. Display systems from New Hampshire. The astronaut spacesuits are from Delaware. The mission commander was born in Indiana, grew up in Arizona. On its moon voyage, it will be controlled from Texas, serviced by computers in Maryland, splashed down near Hawaii. The giant crawler on which it rides was made in Ohio. The genius and sweat of literally the entire nation ride the mission. impossible dream to reach out to the moon is coming true. These men will lead the way. Colonel Frank Borman, Navy Captain Jim Lovell, Lieutenant Colonel Bill Anders. The successful conclusion, the happy ending is history, but gaps remain. Importantly, part of the task of filling those gaps belongs to each individual a self-debriefing to evaluate the larger significance of the event which might have gone unnoticed in the excitement. For some, this re-evaluation has already begun. Dr. Norman Vincent Peale. The mission of Apollo 8, quite apart from its significant scientific meaning, stimulated an immense rejuvenation of the spirit of mankind. And that spirit needed rejuvenation. A year featured by two grim assassinations, by riots, by racial and social strife, and a baffling attempt to end the war left men with a dull sense of frustration. Then at the end of such a year came the Apollo 8, an incredible adventure, when three intrepid spirits circled the moon, fascinating the imagination of man. Their willingness to stake their lives on the Enterprise the infinite perfection of detail which worked precisely, and their deep spiritual understanding of the greater world in which God presides communicated a new sense of man's greatness and gave the world a fresh sense of meaning. Dr. Norman Vincent Peale. Ptolemy suggested that the Earth might be round. Columbus gave a practical demonstration of the fact. If any lingering doubt remains, now man has seen with his own eyes. I have a beautiful view of the S-4B and the uh, Earth here on one. I'll try to get a picture for you. Okay. The S-4B is the third stage rocket engine. Droplets of its vented fuel scatter around it. The speed of the spacecraft, outward bound, brings us face to face with another acceleration, a new fact of life. Historian Arthur Schlesinger, Jr. The salient fact of our age is the fantastic speed-up in the velocity of history. 
It was as recently as 1903 that the Wright brothers soared for a moment over the sand at Kitty Hawk. And today, 65 years later, within the same lifetime of many men, astronauts fly around the moon. And now the velocity of history is carrying us into a new phase in the human adventure. No one knows where this new phase will end, in what triumph or tragedy. But it is clear that the flight of Apollo 8 begins a new epoch in the history of man. Historian Arthur Schlesinger, Jr. Part of beginning an epoch in the present instance is keeping house for six days in a space about the size of the back seats of three station wagons packed for a family vacation. As you watch motion pictures taken on board, you will hear comments relayed to Houston on the same subject. I did I get Happiness is bacon squares for breakfast. You know, eat them, I'll bring them back. We'll polish them off here. Okay, uh, Houston, uh, Apollo 8, here. I stand corrected. Uh, William had one pair of these, and he didn't tell me about it. He stuck it. Part of the astronaut's working gear is a helmet holding earphones and microphone in position. It's called a Snoopy hat. Yeah, you're looking pretty small down there now, Houston. We're carrying a big stick, though. Just barely make that clear lake. And your uh, nozzle temperatures, Bill, have dropped from about 94 to around 66. This is Mission Control. It stands as the first rank of the unnumbered and innumerable Apollo team. Flight controllers man the consoles. They watch a continuing readout of every system in the capsule, three shifts around the clock. All flight controllers speak to the astronauts through one voice, the capsule communicator of each shift. He is an astronaut himself, best suited to sense the needs, the stresses, the preoccupations, the environment of the men so far away. The line of communications is spread round the world. Land bases must be supplemented by ships carrying the special equipment needed to keep the channels open. Aircraft become flying transmitters and receivers. Other nations help with deep space communications. Australians join the team in Canberra, Spaniards in Madrid, the third base is in California. Men, women, and machines spread round the world. This team is knit by faith, an acceptance of responsibility for perfect performance. It stretches back through the ranks to each workman involved in American industry. They kept faith in a spirit of dedication to excellence. The successful completion of the mission is a witness to how they came through. And once achieved, this dedication may be applied in other directions. Henry Ford made comment. The courageous voyage of the Apollo 8 astronauts has done more than extend our knowledge of the universe. It has enlarged the spirit of man. If we can successfully challenge the mysteries and dangers of outer space, surely we can move confidently now to achieve a better, more peaceful life for our fellow humans here and throughout the planet Earth. Mr. Henry Ford. Not all giant eyes and ears on Earth are turned toward the spacecraft. The sensing machines of the Space Particle Alert Network face the sun. From our life-giving sun streams a hail of infinitely small pieces of matter. On Earth, we are shielded from them by our cloak of atmosphere and our magnetosphere, the integument of Van Allen belts. The men and women of SPAN monitor sunspot and solar flare activity, looking for clues to an imminent rise in the stream of potentially hazardous space particles. The team grows wider, deeper, stronger. History repeats itself in paraphrase. This is the shot seen round the world. This is the first shot of Earth, live on television.
The mission was conducted in the plain sight of the entire world, literally. Happy birthday, Mother. Back in 1961, when Apollo goals were first set, President Kennedy said, Whatever mankind must undertake, all men must freely share. Apollo 8 remained true to that pledge. On television, it gave us a new look at the moon and a new look at ourselves. This is Thomas J. Watson, Jr. Ten years ago, it seemed probable that Russia would make this flight before us and would make a moon landing first as well. With the Apollo 8 flight, it becomes obvious that we have moved into the lead. We can be thankful that the United States has shown the world once again that it can accomplish any tasks it decides upon. Thomas J. Watson, Jr., chairman of the board of IBM. Direct from the deep space tracking antenna in Madrid, these pictures were passed along to the Eurovision network to London, Paris, Rome, West Germany, Scandinavia. They were seen in Warsaw, Prague, in Moscow. Citizen of the world, winner of the Nobel Prize for Peace, Dr. Ralph Bunch. Apollo 8 and those stout-hearted astronauts have given to mankind a new and limitless perspective in the universe and to the Earth an added dimension of proximity and neighborliness in the solar system. The epic flight of Apollo 8 in cracking the moon barrier demonstrates that man now has the capability to soar as high and as far as his dreams may project. Dr. Ralph Bunch of the United Nations. Okay, uh, Houston, the moon is essentially gray, no color. Looks like Plaster of Paris, or uh, sort of a grayish beach. Christmas Eve. The date of a mission is dictated by launch windows, which open and close in a long cycle. If you miss one, you wait. The December window opened the 21st, closed the 27th. So the date and hour of the Apollo 8 mission was really determined billions of years ago when the celestial clock was first set in motion. It timed out to the Christmas season. Bob Hope reported a Vietnam reaction. All joy, believe me, all joy. The men I spent Christmas with have a lot on their minds, but the Apollo 8 trip turned out to be as important as anything. What the three astronauts did rubbed off on a lot of guys. Everybody grew a little tall, and that was double if you were away from home. And I think it'll be months before we know how much it meant to all of us and all the people of the world. Bob Hope. It was Christmas on Earth and on the moon. desolate, inhospitable, in unremitting procession. The apparent speed at which you see these pictures is not real time. Only a technical camera was carried on the mission. Altitude about 70 miles, shot with a long lens.
Frank. I think I can say without contradiction that there's been a mighty long dry spell up here. I guess you can say anything you like without contradiction. This film was taken through an optical sighting instrument on board the spacecraft. Two separate images converge on a single eyepiece. It was intended only for space navigation. Navigation in space requires three dimensions instead of two. Scientific sextant observations made on Apollo 8 were a practical, potentially vital gathering of scientific data. Taking the longer view of the scientific value of the mission, comment was made by Dr. Leo Goldberg, astronomer. I believe the Apollo 8 mission will ultimately prove to be of enormous scientific importance as a vital step that had to be taken before men actually land on the moon. Once they do, the exploration of the moon is bound to give us crucial information on how the moon and other bodies in the solar system were formed. Furthermore, the mission proved that we now have the capability to move large and complicated scientific equipment around in space and to deploy it uh, almost anywhere we wish to in the space between the Earth and the Moon. I find this to be a very thrilling prospect indeed. But no matter what happens in the future, the voyage of Apollo 8 will be looked back upon as the mission that proved we could uh, really operate in space on a large scale. Astronomer Leo Goldberg of Harvard University. The condition of zero gravity when you get accustomed to it has some very practical applications. The command module on Apollo 8, serial number 103, did not change at Christmas but there was talk of reindeer and Santa Claus. Right, uh, he was looking for a chimney on 103 here, but he didn't see any. You could have left the hatch unlocked for him. I'll think about that one. Uh, think real hard, Jim. Ecom says he could have slid down the steam duct. Sounds good about that time. Go to the spoil of water. Good luck, America. 
Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on the good earth. Isaac Asimov is a professor of biochemistry and a prolific writer of science fiction. For many years, he's been thinking in terms of an Earth-to-Moon-to-Earth -to -earth trip. Asimov has a special point of view. The feat of Apollo 8 is of peculiar interest to myself because it places me in the unaccustomed position of being over-conservative. In 1939, I wrote a story describing, in essence, this flight. I placed it in 1973. I suppose if someone had asked me then, do you really suppose people will fly around the moon and back to Earth by 1973, I would have answered, not really, but it makes a good story. Well, they did it in 1968, and I am more happy than I can say. Isaac Asimov stands with one foot in the world of science and one foot in fantasy to take a fictional look at the future and underestimates. With both feet in the practical world that now includes outer space, a comment from the returning space capsule during a TV transmission starts us off in another direction. We have you about 180,000. Thank you. Well, looking at yourself to see from 180,000 miles out in space. Mike, what I uh, keep imagining is if I'm a some lonely traveler from another planet, what I think about the Earth from this altitude, whether I think it'd be inhabited or not. Friday, December the 27th. Re-entry, splashdown, acquisition, recovery. The last 15 minutes of the flight began at a speed of almost 25,000 miles an hour. Then, only five miles from the appointed rendezvous in the Pacific, it ended speed zero. If a machine may be said to be born when it performs a useful function, perhaps it is said to die when that function is fulfilled. And having died, it will be enshrined next to its still young ancestors, the aircraft of Orville and Wilbur Wright, Lindbergh, Spirit of St. Louis. But this is not an end, far from it. It is part of a much longer plan. estimated that at some time or another during the flight of Apollo 8, over one billion people all over the face of the globe were tuned into the spacecraft by television or radio. The experience was most widely shared. The astronauts return to the world of men, but there's more. A week to the day after the Apollo 8 splashdown, another Apollo spacecraft had taken up its position on Pad 39 at Cape Kennedy. The countdowns by calendar and clock have begun to bring it to the same moment at which we first saw this Apollo 8 the night before it was born. As launch windows open and close, the next missions move forward two test flights of the lunar landing vehicle, and then the proposed landing on the moon. And plans are in the making now which include flybys of other planets, visits to what Dr. Bunch calls neighbors. Eric Hoffer is a writer, until recently a working longshoreman, whose deep insights into the nature of man have stirred the thinking of many. Let me quote Eric Hoffer's words. I always felt that man is a stranger on this planet a total stranger. 
I always played with the fancy that maybe a contagion from outer space was the seed of man. Hence our preoccupation with heaven, with the sky, with the stars, with a god who was somewhere out there in outer space. It's a kind of homing impulse. We are drawn to where we came from. And I'm just tickled to death that this thing is being done by squares, you know, by average Americans, not by these pretentious intellectuals, because this is the great genius of the average Americans. They take something momentous and make an unmomentous thing out of it. And by the time they are through with it, traveling into space and to the distant stars will become routine. This is why America is an ambiguity in the world, because we make it so that there are no exceptional persons required to do anything. That remarkable trip was made possible by the carefully organized work of many people. Here at the Lewis Research Center, work with liquid rocket fuels and oxidizers in zero gravity led directly to technology important to the lunar spacecraft. In zero-g, liquids do not necessarily settle in what is on Earth, the bottoms of their tanks. The propellants can be in various shapes and locations that could cause catastrophic problems when a rocket engine is shut down in zero-g and then restarting is tried. If propellants are not kept in the bottoms of their tanks, propellant pumps don't work. Lewis researchers used aircraft, AeroB and WASP rockets, and a zero-g drop tower to create short periods of zero-g in order to investigate fluid behavior. The researchers found that only a little bit of thrust is needed to control the fuel location in the tank. So, very small rocket thrusters were used, as required, on the Saturn upper stage to settle propellants in the bottoms of the tanks while Apollo coasted. During the next episode in our film series, we'll see the Saturn Apollo as it carries its crew to mankind's first lunar landing. Until then, this is Jim Burnett saying goodbye from NASA's Lewis Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio.